Thank you for coming this evening and joining us for our first Lamoille Valley Vape Awareness Town Hall. Uh, we are very excited to co-host this uh, with Healthy Lamoille Valley, Jessica Bickford, Brian Duda. Uh, we thank GMA TV for um, filming this and helping us. Um, and Rainey, thank you for your help in orchestrating this. Um, so why, why are we having this town hall? We've had a number of questions from students and families and staff um, about vaping, what it is, why it's harmful. Um, and we've, you'll hear and see some student quotes as we go through this, but you know, some students have said, well, I like the different flavors. And 60% or upwards of 60% of students think that what's in the e-cigarette is flavoring. Um, so, it is our uh, strong feeling that we need to provide more of an education um, so that we're not just working on prevention um, and reacting to e-cigarette use, vaping, but doing some work before that happens. Um, so we're very excited to have this evening with you. Um, I know that there is a question and answer period. Uh, this is not the forum for individual student concerns. Um, this is a forum to ask questions about, you know, to help inform your knowledge. Um, so with that, I will turn this over to Jessica and Brian. Thank you. Uh, we're super excited to be here. A couple of just housekeeping things real quick. Um, you can come over now. Um, is you each got an evaluation form on your way in. This also serves, there's a nice white back here. This is a great place for your questions. Um, we're gonna try to squeeze a lot in, um, and so we may not get to the thing that's circling around in your head because we only have an hour and I hear we have a hard stop at eight o'clock. So, um, so as the evening progresses, if you have questions, please um, write them down and we'll We'll compile those and do our best to get answers back out if they're not answered um, this evening. Also, please do take time to fill out the evaluation form. That helps us in many, many ways. Also, you have a little raffle ticket. Um, we want to thank you for being here. Um, we have 10 $15 gift cards to Two Sons in Hyde Park, and we'd like to give those away. So please um, fill that out and drop it on the bas in the basket on the way out. Um, just a, a quick... Um, run through our agenda. We're going to talk about what are e-cigarettes, the type of e-cigarettes, and e-juice. Um, we're going to talk about how do we get here, details on uh, the vaping epidemic, the effects of vaping, and then we're going to take a little bit of a pause for a moment and what is Lamoille North doing and planning to do. And then we're going to have about 20 minutes of community dialogue, and then the last 10 minutes we'll wrap it up with what can be done. You know, how can you get involved? How can we work to prevent this? So. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Brian. All right, hello everyone. I'm Brian. I'm the Youth Substance Prevention Coordinator for Healthy Lamoille Valley. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly, since we don't have a ton of time, about what e-cigarettes are. And so first, let's define that. So e-cigarettes are a battery-powered device. Um, they heat and disperse liquid. So the e-juice or liquid can be inhaled into the lungs. Um, as you can see, all vapes, and this is a very old generation of vape. This one looks like a cigarette. The vapes nowadays, which we'll show later, look a little bit different, but they all have the same process. Um, so it contains a battery, which, sorry, I went too far. A microprocessor, an atomizer, and a cartridge or tank. Um, so basically, it just charges um, the or the battery <laughs> charges um, in the microprocessor turns the juice into a vape, which is actually an aerosol. It's not a, like a water vapor cloud. It's an aerosol, which later on you'll see it contains nicotine and other tiny particles. All right. 
So I'm gonna do a really brief activity with you all. So they, there are several different vapes in this picture. So you're not gonna raise your hand, but just think, pick, pick out a few. Um, I think there might be six. Pick out six that you think are vapes. All right, now take a look at that and see if you were able to guess any of those correctly. So as this picture demonstrates, right, there's a lot of items out there that look a lot like a vape. The vape is disguised to look like a USB flash drive, a highlighter, a pen, many other common everyday objects. So this makes it so much more difficult for us educators, parents, anyone working with youth to detect these devices. All right, so e-cigarettes have evolved over um, the years. The first one started in the mid-2000s, looked a lot like it, a cigarette, a regular cigarette. Um, it moved on looking a little more sleek as it went on. Um, the third generation, it got what's called a mod attached. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll down on this. Oh. <laughs> Can I have those notes? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, so the fourth generation, many of you might have heard of the term Juul. So that was a very popular um, refillable cartridge. It looked like a USB. You could plug it into your computer or charger. Um, that one used, was flavored for many years until they did a flavor ban and the flavor ban only worked our, with the law, the way it was written is only the, um, the ones that were refillable, like the Juul, um, were banned. And so the vape companies came up with a fancy new generation called disposable vapes. So as long as it's a one-time use, as the law is written, they can get away with creating all sorts of flavors. And speaking of flavors, I'll go to the next slide. Um, there are over 8,000 different vape flavors out there. Oh, thank you. Um, it's called um, the, the juice, it's called e-juice, which is basically um, a liquid that's like a yellowish liquid. I don't know if there's a picture on it there. Um, and there's like um, like I said, over 8,000 flavors, and the flavors in the vape actually mask the harshness as you would get in a cigarette um, or a cigar. So it makes it a lot more palatable for young people and people that might not like the harshness and the burn of a cigarette or, or a cigar, or any combustible cigarette. Um, yeah, so sometimes it's really like, there's a lot of items out there that look a lot like candy, right? And they look a lot like other things. Um, and so you can see the tactics starting to show, and you've probably seen it um, at stores and stuff, of products that look very similar to candy and are very appealing towards youth. Um, and I did um, interview a group of students. They're tech center students from Allied Health. And we asked them all sorts of questions about, you know, what attracts um, you, people your age to vaping, you know, and asked them all about vaping. And one of the quotes from the students was, you want to read that? Okay. Uh, one thing that's different from cigarettes is the flavors and colors. Like it's those things that kids latch onto oh, I can try strawberry or mango or whatever. So yeah, we know um, flavors are one of the hugest draws for these devices, right? They look a lot like candy, um, gum or whatever flavor is popular. There's also um, a lot of vaping accessories going around. So these really conceal um, youth when they vape, or youth or whoever is vaping, it really conceals um, the methods. So there's, 
for instance, you know, there's like a sweatshirt this girl has. Um, there's backpacks, there's phone chargers, there's all sorts of crazy ways, um, products out there that youth use, not just youth, but people who are trying to conceal from teachers, parents, whoever, um, you know, all these kind of like trendy devices. So it just makes that problem that much more difficult to catch. All right. So Jessica's going to take over and, and explain a little bit of how we got here. Yeah, so um, as we look at how we got here, um, the first thing we want to know is, you know, why teens are vaping. You know, this is really popular and it's concerning, but we have to look back, you know, to the root causes. Um, first of all, to experience, to experiment with it. What's it like? You know, it's, you know, there's all these fancy flavors. You know, have you tried that one? Is, you know, what's the, what's the impact? So there's a certain amount of that. Um, we know that it tastes good, um, and so we're hearing that. Um, to have a good time with their friends, there's a social aspect. They're sharing the same device. They're passing it around. Um, and to relax and leave, uh, relieve tension. And th this data, as you can see, um, it's actually a, a few years old. We anticipate um, that this one here on the end is probably actually a little bit higher, that youth are using this kind of as a de-stressor for mental health. So, and then we have another student quote here. Um, I do think that some kids there, uh, I do think that for some kids there is that peer pressure factor. This is a cool thing to do. Yeah, so I mean, that's always a underlying when we look at, at youth behavior. Um, and then the other thing is that there's an increase in marketing. You know, uh, seven in 10 youth are exposed to ads. Um, 58.4 are just right in the stores, 44.6 uh, are on the internet, 26.2% are on TV, and also in magazines. This uh, Vape devices are glamorized, and the, the companies are really targeting where youth are. Um, and recognizing that, as, as most of us in the room are, are over 25, that our feeds, our social media feeds, are very different than what youth are seeing. So that you know, the, the, the algorithms that target youth, um, they're, they're getting a lot more of that advertising than, than we are. However, they are also getting um, anti-vaping. Um, we, we set this up, but maybe it's... Uh, I do see more anti-vaping ads on social media than I do pro-vaping ads, but those are so easy to just scroll past. And there are a lot of people on social media, influencers, who do vape and smoke in the videos they post. Yeah, so right now we're kind of in the age of the influencer, the, the YouTuber, the, you know, the, the gamer, um, and the, a lot of them are using these vape devices, so we're seeing that a fair bit. Um, and then when you ask, you know, teens what's in their e-cig, a lot of them just think it's just flavoring. Brian already mentioned this. Um, you know, some of them don't know. There's a few that do. Um, there also, um, if you don't know, uh, vaping can also uh, contain cannabis. Um, and, you know, there's 1.3% who think it's, it's something else. Um, and then the student quote here is, I think the problem is that people still don't know exactly what kind of chemicals are used in these vape flavors. They know they're bad, but not exactly how bad. So that's something that we can do is really kind of start to demystify what's in these devices. So. And then when we look at uh, Vermont local data, you can see the, the lifetime ever try that has gone up, but also the frequency. Um, it used to be, you know, back in 2015, it was like 48% that were like one or two days, but now it's flip-flopped, you know, that there's more daily use. Uh, students are becoming really dependent and addicted to these devices. Um, when we look at Lamoille Union High School data, 57% have ever tried um, a vape device, and 31% have vaped in the last 30 days. And this is from the 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey data. And then when you look at middle school, 22% have tried it, and 12% uh, are um, uh, currently using it. And that was 8% for the state at that time. So. Um, and vaping can really be, an, uh, it's, science, uh, it's proven, uh, the data bears it out, that it's an on-ramp to uh, smoking. So a, a non-user 
you know, somebody who's never vaped is only 10.2% likely to, to try a cigarette in their life. But e-cigarette users, uh, that, that number jumps to 47%. So that, that's especially concerning uh, when you look at, like, okay, you know, it's supposed to be safer, but if it's leading our kids down, that it's, it's really not. So, um, and that's a 6.8% likelihood of smoking. Uh, so, and the effects of vaping. All right, I'm back. So I'm just going to go over briefly some of the short-term, long-term effects of vaping. And I think this was mentioned. So vaping is like a delivery system, right? So you can vape nicotine, e-juice. You can vape marijuana, cannabis. And you can vape um, what's nowadays called either vitamin vapes or wellness vapes, which really we don't really know what's in them. And it has been found after studies that they're has been nicotine detected in those. Um, but really, most of the vapes that are found in stores that you're not, that people aren't putting their own cannabis in, um, they do contain nicotine, which is, as we know from cigarettes, is a very, very highly addictive um, substance, especially to the developing brain. It actually like shocks the brain in such an intense way that it makes it very hard to overcome that addiction. And this, of course, impacts uh, attention, learning, mood, uh, impulse control, which is going to affect schoolwork, it's going to affect outside of school activities, all that, all those consequences. Um, and teens, you know, already struggle with some of <laughs> those things, as we know. Um, all right. So I wanted to show, too, that these devices do have a very high concentrate of nicotine. So just to give you kind of the equivalency of how much nicotine's in a vape device compared to a pack of cigarettes, um, it shows that a jewel pod is equal to about 40 cigarettes worth of nicotine. A puff bar is about 80 cigarettes. So they, the generations have gotten even um, higher doses of nicotine and um, and basically, there are teens, you know, some teens use several of those a week, right? So that's a lot of nicotine to be going through. Yeah. All right, and I'll just read the student quote. It seems like kids know that vaping is bad for them, but it's the mindset of un untouchable that keeps them going. They may not understand that this stuff is still addicting. All right. So yeah, as a lot of, as it was stated in the previous slide, a lot of young people really think it's just flavoring or water vapor that's in a vape or that they're inhaling in their lungs. Um, when in fact, there's a lot of those carcinogens and other kind of nasty stuff that can be found in a traditional cigarette. Um, and no matter what you are vaping, whether it's nicotine or a wellness vape, you're always inhaling this ultra-fine metal particles from the vape device itself. Um, so basically, no vape is healthy, right? And those flavors have lots of other nasty chemicals in them, a lot of which I can't pronounce the name, so I'm not going to get into that. And again, um, this is a new trend, right? So vaping was invented, or the e-cigarette was invented around 2003 didn't really become popularized till 10, 15 years ago. And so we really don't know the long-term effects of vaping. Um, there was, and there, ha and there continues to be this trend called E-Valley, which I'm trying to remember what's the... Uh... It's, it's also called popcorn lung. Yeah. It's, a, it's an inflammation of the lungs. Yeah, it's basically, um, an inf it's a very like serious lung condition that, ha that happens um, that has either seriously harmed or killed people um, throughout the country. Um, it's, it still happens. It's not extremely common, but it's something that definitely, you know, should raise some concern. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, the CDC states that 
these products should never be used by youth, young adults, and that no tobacco product, and e-cigarettes are a tobacco product, are safe. They always carry a risk. All right. And some of these, so there's a ton of symptoms up there, right? And um, some of those can happen and occur quite, um, in quite a short amount of time. So it says from even just several days to several weeks. So stuff that really affects your, you know, your lungs, such as cough and chest pain and shortness of breath. Um, definitely making stuff like sports very difficult. Um, you know, there's abdominal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And there's definitely that increased risk for disease, for um, heart, you know, heart attacks, increased risk for infections, like youth tend to share vapes a lot, but also vaping weakens your immune system and causes, um, can cause a lot of infections, or make, it, make you more susceptible to getting infections. Um, yeah, so a lot of different symptoms from short term to long term, but again, we don't really know the true long term effects of these. And I'll pass it to Jess. She's going to go over some signs your teen might be vaping. Um, and I'm just going to actually read this part because it says it better than better than I can. So, um, we've learned as someone uses a nicotine product, the chemical is absorbed into their system, and mood and pleasure centers are aroused. The tolerance and physical dependence for the substance increases as use continues. Going without nicotine can produce withdrawal symptoms as well as a craving for more nicotine. The cycle continues to repeat. As we continue to learn about vaping and nicotine addiction, there are signs to look for to identify uh, if your child or student is vaping. If your child or student is normally calm and very easygoing, but now they seem very anxious and irritable um, with a lot, not a lot of patience, um, is it just the teenage years or could the child be vaping? Often someone who is dependent on nicotine has a difficulty concentrating. Uh, if a student is vaping and they are having this nicotine withdrawal in class, they may not be paying attention to the teacher, but rather thinking of when they can get their next nicotine fix on their vaping device. Um, other symptoms, you know, um, are change in eating patterns, um, weight fluctuation, mouth sores, dry mouth, unexplained nosebleeds, um, sudden interest in burning scented candles or incense to cover the scent, um, sudden use of perfume or cologne, and missing phone chargers. Um, and so at this point, we're actually going to turn it over to... Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so first, yeah, it's all good. Um, I'm Beth Ann Peary, so I'm the principal at the high school. Um, and Denise and I have worked on a lot of this stuff together. And I wouldn't say, um, this says, uh, okay, good. It does say what we are doing and planning to do. Um, because I think as we look forward to next year, it really is just a continuation of the things that we've already started to implement. Um, so Denise, if you want to kind of start off and then I'll fill in what there's anything that we're doing that you're not so at the middle level we're catching the kids hopefully before too many of them are being exposed or becoming addicted what we really see uh, going into next year is we have a new health teacher who's coming on board and one of her primary units will be around the effect of substances on the body and making healthy choices and setting goals and finding resources if they may have already become addicted or think they may be or have concerns. Because at that age, they are a little bit, um, we, we want to catch them uh, while we still have a chance. So that's a big piece of, of what I'm, we're looking forward to next year. And both seventh and eighth grade students will have access to those resources, or that class, I should say. Um, there's also increased monitoring in our bathrooms because that's where kids are going to come together. Uh, they're with their peers. It's where they're most likely to try it. So there's increased monitoring there. And then if we do have a student who is caught um, vaping, 
Uh, they get some more educational components with our school counselor and we have conversations with the family. Because it's not just the student that we want to help, we also want to help the family find resources in order to help their student. And then we pass them up to yeah. the high school. Yes. Um, so I, this year, I don't think the work could have happened without Healthy Lamoille Valley. Um, they sat with Denise and I, they made sure we got a grant um, that was, it was, it was huge in, in helping us really get started um, and make some changes in, in what we're doing and hopefully um, more changes in the future. So we applied for an ADAP grant and we received it. Um, the good news is we let um, the state know that we would like it again and we received it again for next year, uh, which is awesome. And part of that money is going into training our staff, our faculty and staff. So we actually kicked off the year with a training Healthy Lamoille Valley, um, uh, Lamoille County Mental Health, the Sheriff's Department, we even had like Vermont Liquor Control here. Um, and we did this awesome training where staff got to take those devices, tear them apart, look at them, learn how students are using chargers to actually get away with taking one of the disposable flavored vapes and making it rechargeable. Um, they're quite good at that. So learning, you know, just really kind of a hands-on experience and, and getting to know what's out there. Uh, so then we've dug into our handbook, looking at our practices and what we're doing when a kid does make a mistake or um, is really struggling, like how are we supporting them? Um, and that work continues and, and we're not done yet. So. Uh, we, like the middle school, we have started a spreadsheet where we are checking in on bathrooms every 15 minutes. So we have staff that are signing up and we're just making sure that we're cycling through the school. Um, and it's just so students know we're out and about and that uh, we're around because a lot of students want to use a safe and clean bathroom and don't want to walk in where someone has been vaping. Um, Obviously, having a school resource officer present on campus, um, it was a huge uh, help to us, and we are really excited that we have another one coming. Um, we will continue to partner with Lam the Lamoille Family Center, and um, Brian has had some Lamoille students working with the Getting to Why group that I actually think is being run out of the Tech Center. Uh, and then a big thing that we started this year is when students are struggling with substance use, we've partnered with Behavioral Health and Wellness, and they are coming in once a week, and they're running these eight-week sessions um, for small groups with students that are struggling. And so they've done some really cool stuff from a Wandering for Wellness group, where the kids actually get to go outside and um, just explore in nature and kind of work through some of this. Uh, and then they've, they did some indoor groups this winter um, and we hope to see that continue. And then let's see. Uh, most recently, I went to Winooski and I joined our um, school nurses. So part of the first day was for administrators. So we looked at um, policies, practices, search and seizure, all of that stuff. And then the second day was really about screening and how to identify substances and um, if we have students that are under the influence. Uh, so that was, that was really helpful. And uh, the final two things, um, looking at curriculum. And so Healthy Lamoille Valley and uh, the TimeWise curriculum, which is really looking at prevention and like getting kids to start thinking about how they're spending their time and making sure that they're engaging with things that are meaningful, keeping themselves busy um, and kind of avoiding the possibility that they might find themselves in a situation where vaping is happening. Um, and we are just now kind of exploring a universal screener for all kids. So this would be like uh, social emotional wellness, substance use, um, and so we're looking at a universal screener and what we would need to get that set up and running. So those are, that was a lot, um, but again, a lot of things we're already doing, some things are in the works, but we could not do it uh, without 
the help from our community partners. So thank you. So at this point, we want to hear from you. Mark is actually going to come up. Uh, we're going to have a community dialogue. So let's uh, all go. So. Oh, thanks. So are there any questions? As per our guidelines that we have, we've got two minutes per, per, per person to um, ask. If there are any questions, please bring them forward now. I actually had one. The puff bar that was up there that is equal to four packs of cigarettes. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> is that considered a um, like a non rechargeable device so that can be flavored yet it has the most amount of nicotine and then about how long do those last as someone that using them and everybody hear that question okay yeah that's a great question um, Yes, they are one of those disposable, so they can be flavored. However, there is a bill going through the Vermont legislator. There's so many steps to that. Um, <laughs> I took some youth down. We did some advocacy work um, for our legislators, which was amazing. But um, yeah, so I don't, I forgot to look up how many puffs are in a puff bar, <laughs> but I think I've heard that s some students who are active users can go through a couple or more, like one, between one and four, maybe in a week. Yeah, I've heard that. There's 2,000 to 400, 4,000 puffs in one bar of vaping. <laughs> <laughs> um, so could you, Brian, talk a little bit about the refusal skills program? Because I think we hear a lot about it, but I'm not sure everyone is aware of what it is. Um, yeah, so the refusal, so I facilitate a two-part, two-session refusal skills workshop to all the sixth graders in Lemoral North and also the other districts we work in as well. Um, so really what that entails is, um, so the first part is really learning about, starting with protective factors, which is a fancy word for those positive, great things in our life that help us to make healthy choices, such as having a trusted adult, having life goals, all that great stuff. Um, and then we do an activity about perception versus reality of, you know, a lot of us, a lot of young people think that everyone's vaping, especially vaping. They're always, they think, they guess how many students, what percentage of middle school students are using a substance. And, you know, sometimes I guess 90%, right? They think everyone's using. We give them the actual data, which is, it's around 7% for the middle schoolers. Um, and they're, pretty surprised by that usually and so it's just giving them like you know pr more perspective that a lot of times we think everyone's doing something in reality they're not um, we talk we do it um, talk about addiction and how it's a disease and how it affects the brain how it affects the developing brain um, and then we dive into the substances a little more so we take a deeper dive into vaping what it is how it affects the brain and body, um, cannabis, alcohol, and I have um, shared some about fentanyl too, which is a, a growing concern. Um, so that's just session one, right? I pack a lot into session one. Session two is really that skill building. And so we, I have students really look at what is, you know, what is your reason for being substance free or wanting to be substance free when you're young, when your brain's still developing. So they really take a look inside and figure out what's, you know, what they care about that can help them when they're making life choices. And then they learn skills about making decisions. And so like thinking ahead, like what situations might this happen where you might be offered a substance? What obstacles might get in the way of that? Um, how do you, you know, get out of a situation you're uncomfortable with? And then there's a, 
there's eight different refusal strategies I teach them. So we used to learn to just say no. And of course, no is part of the equation. You can say no, but there's also things like you can blame your parents, you can make an excuse, you can use humor, you can do all sorts of different things um, just to help kind of back up you know, when you refuse and really, um, yeah, so they, so students get into groups, they practice those, we do practice scenarios, um, and then just kind of wrap it up, talk about a little bit about middle school and the transition to middle school, and provide them with resources, all sorts of things, and sorry for taking like a really long time to share about that, because um, we do cover so much in just those two sessions. Um, we usually get to pretty much all of it at by the end. Um, and yeah, it's been amazing, gotten great feedback from students, from teachers. Oh, just that, that, we, that was something we started about five years ago, and it started with one school, and it's kind of been trickling out and growing. Um, and one of the things that Brian didn't share, because it's, it's sort of out of district here, is for the first time we actually had, this time year we had, um, actually three other schools where Brian was able to teach their staff how to run it. And in one school, we even had two students share with staff um, going into the younger grades. So that's, that's actually our ultimate goal, is that we can replicate Brian by, by passing the skill on to others to be able to teach that. Anyone else? Thank you. I'm Laura. Hey, um, during my younger years, they talked about secondhand smoke and how it could cause lung cancer, even though you don't necessarily smoke a cigarette in your life. Um, I know it's kind of early, but I would assume that there must be some kind of study that shows if this is like a something that's going to affect people that are around vapors. Do you know anything about that? I, um, I can't give you like concrete facts about that, but I've definitely read in the literature, I've read that yes, secondhand vape is a thing for sure, and it can definitely affect your health. Again, there's no like long-term studies because it's so new, and the effect of that is less so than direct vaping, but yes, that can negatively affect, and we'll find out as uh, time goes on, right? <laughs> Anyone else? Bart Bazzaio, um, I guess this is more directed toward our administrators and, and leadership at the school, but it seems like we're doing a lot of great work. Um, how do we, how do we measure that this is actually having a positive impact or, or do we even need to throw more resources at it? I guess what, you know, what, what are the ways that you're trying to track that? Um, so we keep data on everything. So anytime there is um, a concern brought to our attention, like we note it, but if there is actually a student that has a vape or that's state reportable data, um, so that is all tracked. And so we can look across years and look at um, how many incidents there have been and um, be able to kind of measure our success that way. So everything is, is kind of, yeah. We've got numbers. Um, what's interesting, and I don't know if this is true or not, so, um, but what I can say is that what, what we're noticing is that the students that um, are, are, are found with a vape at school are students that are really struggling with addiction. And they're not necessarily wanting to bring a vape to school or vape at school, but they're really struggling with getting away from it. Um, and that we are seeing honestly, less and less um, individual students, um, you know, being caught with a vape, but more like students that are frequently, the same student frequently vaping um, and they're struggling. So getting them the support that they really need is, um, is proving to be more successful.
two years. And it would be very interesting to see what that trajectory looks like after we spend so many resources and, and education on uh, vape awareness and, and other kinds of substance use. So that will be something we're looking at in sort of a longitudinal way. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Awesome. Thank you for the, the good questions. Um, so just, you know, what can be done? Um, you know, each of us cares deeply of, about our students um, and our kids. Um, and so we have a few more quotes here. Um, if parents were to talk to their kids about whether or not they vape, I'd say go ahead or go about it in a really calm way. If you get angry or start yelling at your kids, they are going to just shut down or it might push them to vape or smoke even more. Um, and so that's some wisdom from, from our kids. Um, so how do you do that? Um, you know, it's, it's always hard. You know, I have a, a ninth grader and a, a junior um, here in this district. And it's, how do you have those conversations? There's always like this awkward moment where you're thinking about it. Um, and so what I found is from experience and talking to other parents is, you know, taking time to really think through what, what do I want to say to them? How do I plan for that conversation? And there's two really great resources for that. Um, there's parentupvt.org, um, it's a Department of Health website, and it really leads you through um, thinking about this. And the other thing is actually the talk they hear you, um, there's copies of it, and it's actually an app on my phone, and it gives me scenarios where I can kind of think through like, okay, you know, we're just driving in the car, what conversations might I have? What might be the things that my kids say back to me? You know, and, and so that one's based around alcohol. But what's been found is when you work, do the work to prevent one substance, you actually open the doors to preventing other substances. So there's some transferable skills there. Um, start conversations with your kids, not always about substances. Talk about also, what, what do your kids want to talk about and then use that teachable uh, <laughs> moments. Listen to them, like what are they bringing up? What are their concerns? Ask them what their concerns are. Um, and while you're asking, ask for support. You know, you probably all have other parents that you talk to. You know, talk to each other. Um, you know, talk to us you know brian's in the schools regularly you're you have great school staff you know hey i really want to talk to my kids about this and i'm not sure you know where to start or i'm hearing this you know kind of bounce ideas off each other um as you're talking to their kids answer their questions and answer them honestly you know i think the worst thing that we can do is is sugarcoat things um, or, or give some sort of trite answer and it's also okay to say i don't know let me let's do some research together um, and while you're doing research uh, together, um, if you go to the Healthy Limoil Valley website, uh, Brian has actually put together a really amazing resource. Uh, it's the youth resource page, um, because we know that kids don't always come to us first. They often will talk to each other. So we wanted to create a resource of well-vetted materials. Um, so, and on that, there's resources um, so to help uh, quit if you know kids that are vaping and, and want to start that process. Um, you know, keep the conversation going. It's not just one big talk with your kids. I think, you know, when I was growing up, it was the talk, you know, whatever the thing is. But it's often these ongoing conversations using little moments. Um, the talk they hear you says, you know, 100 one-minute conversations are better than one 10-minute conversation. So really seizing that opportunity um, and meeting your kids where they're at. Um, for the quit, you know, if you know somebody is vaping, you know, give them grace. You know, we all need grace, but also like let them know that you're there to help and support them, you know, and bring in those partners. Um, there's the My Life, My Quit uh, through the Department of Health. Uh, there's This Is Quitting, uh, Quit Start app. Um, there's also a toolkit for educators, um, and there's a, a couple copies over there, um, but the link is also on our website. Uh, so there's, there's definitely, because this is a national problem, there's so many different resources out there. Um, you know, and then uh, checking in with your kids is always a great, um, and the kids in your life. When I say your kids, it doesn't necessarily have to be your biological kid. It might be the kids you coach. It might be the ones that come to the library. It might be your next door neighbor, you know, um, and whatever level is appropriate you know this, some of this is Jeff definitely for the parent caregiver but also you know know who they where they are who 
who they're with and when they're going to be home. You know, just simple things like that show your show that you care uh, and that you're paying attention. Um, you know, attend school events, go to their concerts, go to their drama, go to their you know basketball or baseball games. Um, making connections, knowing the names and contact information um, for their friends and the parents of their friends. You know, is somebody going to be home when you're at that house? You know, so. Um, Limit the, the opportunities, you know, of, of unsupervised kids um, and setting rules and boundaries, you know, uh, you know, adult supervision, curfews, open door policies um, and being consistent and fair uh, in enforcing those consequences um, and keeping them busy, you know, engaged kids. That's like the biggest protective factor for our kiddos, um, you know, and finding the things that they want to be engaged in. So. You know, is it theater? Is it singing? Is it sports? Um, is it video gaming? You know, sometimes we're like, oh, video games, you know, especially our generation. But, you know, find ways to have that be a positive. Um, play them with your kids. Um, you know, um, yeah. Um, and, and this is a good one. Uh, children who needed to check in with their parents about their free time, we're half as likely to try tobacco products. So, you know, having those boundaries and those check-ins are, are really important. Um, and then, you know, you know, this is what what you expect. You know, being clear and direct about what you expect and why. Um, we don't want you to use vape or tobacco products. I'm proud of you for not using e-cigarettes. Um, in our family, nobody under the age of 21 could smoke or vape or use alcohol or, or you know other things, you know, so really setting those expectations as, as the adults, um, how to respond, teach them how to respond with refusal skills that Brian was talking about, exit strategies. You know, um, a few years ago we had Michael Nerney uh, here to present and he talked about, uh, he would give his kids an out when they go to parties. They would call and say, hey, is Uncle Joe coming tonight? There was no actual Uncle Joe, but it just was that code word. Or now with the phones, you can text. So they don't necessarily out themselves. But Michael was like, it's the, anytime that happens, I know I go pick up my kids, no questions asked, except for one. When they get in the car, it's, is there anybody else in there that needs to come with you? You know, that's unsafe. Um, you know, and not getting all over their case in that moment. You know, have the conversations about what was happening the next day. Give them that space. Um, uh, you know, helping them to know why it's important, you know, not just because it's bad for you, but, you know, you have all this potential, you know, you know, you, you really want to play sports or you really want to sing well and, you know, vaping, that'll mess with your vocal cords, you know, so help them think clearly about that. Um, also help them think really clearly about friendships um, and, and, you know, Friends that respect each other's boundaries are good friends, you know, and so all of this is important. But also, you know, our kids sometimes make mistakes. We make mistakes. Um, so do have consequences if they do. Um, if you find out your child has experimented, be clear and consistent about the consequences. Um, and here are um, a few consequences that parents have used. Loss of phone privileges for a week. Um, loss of a month of allowance. Limitation on social activities. Um, writing a report or sitting down with them, you know, together and going through a, a vape website. Like, what, what is this? You know, having those conversations could be a good consequence as well. Um, and then just, you know, as parents, be engaged. Uh, talk with other parents and community members. Um, email or call your school or, your, you know, get involved in your PTA if you're at the younger levels. Um, Healthy Lamoille Valley or a coalition. Um, in the last year, we've had about 200 people involved in some project or another. So I'd love to keep, have you involved and to keep that going. Um, there's also uh, Parents Against Vape, uh, the PAVE, or the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Uh, so there's some grassroots advocacy groups there. Um, and then, you know, we also have... Um, the Youth Vaping Cessation Roundtable Conversation, which we have a vape and tobacco task force. Um, and the ne their next meeting is May 23rd at 3.30. It's a Zoom meeting. Um, and you can either email Brian or actually there's a, a QR code on the poster that's out at the registration table. And we wanted to end with this quote. Do you wanna read that? Um, yeah, it's really just kind of, um, I'll just read it first. I do think students know they can go to teachers and counselors here at school, but there's always a judgment piece that can scare kids. 
Like, if I say something, am I going to get in trouble? And so as, you know, as we work with the schools, we're making it a lot more restorative and like, and with the piece of the parents, you know, we're not here to um, tell kids that they're going to get in trouble, right? We're here to help kids. And that's really what it, what it's all about. Um, and I just want to share too, you know, all our res we have tons of resources on our table, so please check it out. We have a resource, I don't know if this was mentioned, but if, your teen already is vaping, like how to have that conversation, how to address it and do it in a restorative way, but having consequences as well. Um, but I just want to thank everyone for being, giving us this opportunity. Um, and yeah, I'll send it there. <laughs>